In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Maybe seven, eight years ago, I was deep into the self-improvement game, and I thought it might be helpful to make a little chart for myself. On one side of an index card, I listed out all the things Paul names as works of the flesh. On the other side, I listed what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. My thinking was, if I kept these things front of mind, I could make sure I was moving away from those fleshly works and exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. That little index card was almost definitely going to fix everything that was wrong with me. If that sounds like freedom to you, see me after class. I suppose my thinking was that envy and anger were enslaving me, and if I could just be generous and gentle, if I could just have self-control, I would be free. But the idolatry of that index card, the idolatry of improving myself, those are what enslave me. In 12-step recovery programs, there's a very useful tool called inventory, which we use to take stock of what's making us angry or afraid so that we can identify patterns and understand our motives and subsequently ask God to correct those misdirected instincts. If we've harmed someone because of our fear or anger, we may attempt to make it right, to make amends. But ultimately, it's up to some power greater than ourselves to take that fear and anger away from us. And of course it is, because if I could take away my own fear and anger, then I could probably take away my desire to drink and I wouldn't have needed a program of recovery in the first place. But when we're given work to do, like making amends, we start to think that we're the ones saving ourselves. We start to believe that we've made ourselves free by the virtue of our own actions. And it's at that point that we're in more bondage of our own wills than ever. We are most imprisoned when we believe we can free ourselves. We are most imprisoned when we believe we are free to choose. But perhaps we do not choose licentiousness any more than we choose peace. Perhaps impurity and drunkenness are not works of the flesh we choose, but rather indicators of our slavery to death. Perhaps love and gentleness are not fruit of the spirit that we can earn, but rather the evidence that Christ has set us free. What I learned from doing my own inventory and amends process is that though there are consequences for my actions, that doesn't always mean that I'm in control of them. While I must be accountable, I'm not always, for lack of a better word, responsible. There's a reason that judgment belongs to Christ alone. I am not the judge, says Karl Barth. Jesus Christ is the judge. The matter is taken out of my hands, and that means liberation. We talk a lot about freedom and liberation in our country, and it's a slippery subject. In so many ways, we have more freedom than anyone else in the world. But there are many U.S. citizens who have never had the same freedoms others of us enjoy. Something like half of us recently had our freedom even further curtailed. Many of us have gained some freedoms only to see them taken away again, or at best, threatened to be. 
I think we're all less free than we realize. Stanley Hirawa says, America is the attempt to produce a people who believe that they should have no story except the story that they chose when they had no story, and that that's what Americans mean by freedom. I've been unpacking the idea that of a people who believe that they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story for nearly a decade and I still barely understand it. But I do know that he's on to something. Harawash tries to explain this idea by asking us if we think we ought to be held accountable for decisions we made when we did not know what we were doing. Of course, we usually respond, no, because it is assumed that you should only be held accountable when you acted freely and that means you had to know what you were doing. But Stanley astutely points out that such an account of responsibility makes something like marriage unintelligible. How could you ever know what you were doing when you promised lifelong monogamous fidelity? And the truth is, we almost never know what we are doing. We simply cannot comprehend the potential or actual consequences of our so-called choices. Hirewas talks a lot about the role that the church plays in this. The church wants to witness our marriage vows because the church is responsible for helping us uphold them. But somewhere along the way, I think we've reimagined that sort of community support as individual responsibility for which we are required to hold one another accountable. What I mean is the church should be a hospital for sinners. But we sometimes make it more like a pageant for the morally upright or worse, a courtroom. But once I understand that I can no better condemn you than I can justify myself, I've taken the first step toward truly loving both myself and my neighbor, toward being guided by the Spirit. Once I understand that my salvation is complete, once I understand that I am justified by faith alone, then I am truly free.